Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for returning. I hope you are shaking off the Friday night stupor because we are waking up with watches. Everything on the table is for sale. Price is in the description. If the watch is so new that it's not on our site yet, email me for pricing. Today we have an incredible selection and we're starting right at the top. It's not often that I open with Grubel Forsey, but that is exactly what I am doing today. Grubel Forsey Double Tourbillon 30 Degree Technique, a timepiece that is larger than life. 47.5 millimeters with one, two, three, four mainspring barrels and two tourbillon regulators. It is truly extravagant in the imperial sense. I mean in the French imperial sense. This is a watch fit for a Bourbon. Now the timepiece, 47.5 millimeters in red gold, represents the original Grubel Forcey innovation, the double tourbillon 30 degrees, inclined at 30 degrees, two tourbillon regulators inside a 47.5 millimeter rose gold case. You can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it fits just barely. I wouldn't wear it on a wrist any smaller than this, but you can see that it is surprisingly easy to wear for something this grand. Now quickly flipping back to the dial, you can see that the dial includes includes those two tourbillon regulators. One makes a circuit every 60 seconds, the other, as you can see with the four-pronged sapphire cutout, makes a circuit every four minutes with a 60 second sweep down at the bottom. You have the four stacked mainspring barrels giving the watch days of power reserve. No problem here, this watch will run for 120 hours. A power reserve indicator and exceptional depth, you can see that the movement, which is 38.4 millimeters in diameter and 12.15 millimeters thick, is actually larger than some entire Rolex watches. Super graphics on the flanks of the case. You can see the letters in, of course, the French of Grubel Forcey's native La Chaux de Fonds, illustrating their philosophy of fine finish and manufacture in the old style. The lugs are beautiful with a concave bowl-like profile, black polished. You can see they have a curvature to them and a complex contouring that defies description and simply must be seen. Rest assured, though this is a monstrous timepiece, it is rife with nuance. Turn it all over, you can see nickel copper zinc, that Mysore material that we call German silver on a longa, and the bridges are frosted with immense mirrored anglage, so large you need not a loop to appreciate it. Note the black polish on the underside of the tourbillon bridge. Also note the use of jewels in chiton, pocket watch style, and the fact that there are multiple interior angles that sharp crease where two beveled edges meet with all screw heads black polished, chamfered slots and circumference. The Grubel Forcey double tourbillon 30 degrees. Okay, if that's my opening bid, you're wondering where this show ends. I guess we'll find out, but not before a brief detour through the world of Omega. And we're going to start with the Omega that I think everyone agreed was one of the best watches of 2018. 25 years of the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter, a watch that launched in 1993 but came into its own and dashed to immortality on the wrist of Pierce Brosnan in Goldeneye. Now the timepiece, of course, for Goldeneye in 1995, a quartz for the final three turns as Bond, Brosnan wore the mechanical chronometer. And that's what we have here. Now 42 millimeters, the watch features a ceramic dial with the famed Omega Wave, but that's been laser etched. You can see it to good effect right there. The, the glare is actually helping me out. You can see how deeply etched that wave pattern now is. The ceramic dial, polished black and lustrous, has all the advantages of enamel, but without the expense or the fragility. Ceramic bezel insert, let's hear the bezel. It is a dive watch, we gotta know. It's chunky, it's sharp. It's easily the best diver 300 meter bezel yet. Now this black dial version is handsome and universal. And though it's a 42, it wears the same size on the wrist as something like a Rolex Sub 40 on a full bracelet. So consider them equivalents. You've got the full Bond style bracelet with the polished intermediates and the five link look, but here's the thing, it's more squared off on its edge now and it features screws holding the removable links. No more pin sleeves here. Upgrades on the underside, you can see the case back of the watch featuring a caliber 8800 coaxial chronometer. Let's see if I can get some more light there. Harrison's doing a great job on camera. Let me see if I can help him out with our studio lights. Free sprung, full balance, shock resistant, silicon hairspring, anti-magnetic, 300 meters, helium escape valve for you Heliox divers. Throw it on the wrist and it's an easy watch to wear. As you can see, 13.7 millimeters thick, but it wears lower as it cradles down and nestles on the wrist. 50 millimeters from lug to lug means this is a pretty universally wearable watch. And one of the best new features has been the introduction of a double sliding 
and pull out dive extension system. So you have the push button slider that allows you to push the button and make adjustments, 9.7 millimeters of incremental adjustment. Then you have the fold out extension. That's the works and as good or better than anything you'll get from Rolex at twice the price. You can pick those up for well under 4,000. Again, price is in the description. I think you'll be pleased. Now, a different sensibility and a different model line, but from the same brand, this is the 2016, 2998 piece Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch CK2998, named after the model that debuted back in 1959 and which flew with Wally Shira in late 1962. That was a personally owned watch, and this could be personally owned by you. It's designed to look like his CK2998, but not too slavishly. You have the same 39.7 millimeter stainless steel case without crown guard structures or extensive beveling that you saw on the first Omega in space of 2012. That model lends its case, but the dial is all original. Something of a sort of, I guess you could call it a blue panda. It is that. It has a drop seconds track outboard with cantilevered applique indices, a ceramic tachymeter insert, and then the ceramic tachymeter insert features full loom. It's impressive. Sapphire crystal inside caliber 1861, a Moonwatch caliber, 48 hour power reserve, 21 six beat rate. It's based on the Lemania 1873 about, and you can see individual numbering for this limited series. Now you throw it on the wrist, and I got, I made Harrison a promise I would show dial, wrist shot, and case back, so I'm gonna get back to that. You can see the watch wears well. It wears more compact than a moon watch, and as you can see with the sapphire rather than the plexiglass, it also sits a little bit lower. The use of blue alligator leather is handsome and appropriate, and this watch will function as a dress watch. Handsome and versatile, it's still a sports watch through and through, make no mistake. At least Wally would know that, but today it's more of a fence straddler between the worlds of the fine couture and the rough and tumble. Now, sticking with our sports watch on bracelets and sticking with Omega, let's talk about a watch that bowed back in 2015. This was, for a time, probably the most appealing Planet Ocean model, and it remains compelling today. This is the Planet Ocean GMT Good Planet. Let me do what I can about the glare here. You could see that the watch in what was then an exclusive 43.5 millimeter case, uh, stainless steel with a blue ceramic insert for the bezel and then the lacquer creating the orange indices and numerals is applied deeply and richly. Now it is a bi-directional GMT bezel with a blue lacquer dial and a handsome piece. It features a combination of unusual colors with the blue, the silver, and the orange. Now on the wrist, it's big. It wears true to size, more wearable than the gargantuan 45.5 millimeter watch, but also more substantial than the 42. You can see that the timepiece is thick on the wrist as the Planet Oceans tend to be. I should mention that as a dual time with a 60 hour power reserve, fully loomed dial, 600 meter diving depth, and the helium escape valve, this is a true do it all adventure watch. But I need to emphasize it features a bi-directional GMT bezel rather than a conventional unidirectional diving bezel. Case back shot, let's quickly flip that over. You can see the caliber 8605, specially made for this model. The GMT, 60 hour power reserve, twin barrels, free sprung, silicon hairspring, all of that good stuff. Now it has the ability to set those two separate time zones on the dial side, and you can see that well here. 24 hour hand in orange, and then you have broad arrow hour and minute hands for the time of day. A lovely piece, and of course, we're talking about Seamasters, we're talking about dive extensions. This one does have the fold out dive extension. Very crisp, machined from a solid ingot of steel. The clasp, of course, a descendant of the great Omega dive clasps of the 1990s that forced Rolex to get its act together and phase out the old stamped oysters. Speaking of Rolex, I have defamed them. Allow me to post a repost in their defense. A model discontinued in 2013 with the arrival of the Z Blue. This is now the most collectible of the modern Milgauss models. Since 2007, this one debuted back in 2007. Initially, it was the least popular. The first was the GV with the green crystal, then the black dial with the clear crystal, and then the white dial. Some folks call this the Milgauss Tic Tac, and I can see the inspiration. Blackened indices with orange luminova, orange accents on the dial, orange lightning bolt seconds hand, and of course that lovely white. It's a fascinating white because it's not Rolex opaline silver. This is chalk white. And 
And the timepiece, like I said, the most collectible of the modern Milgauss because it is the rarest. It's amazing how a watch can go from unloved in the dealer's case to desirable on the secondary market. Of course, discontinued, they're not making any more of them. The Milgauss is a handsome piece because of its balance. 40 millimeter case, no rotating bezel for cleanliness, no date, no cyclops eye. It's a handsome watch, especially with the white dial. You can see with my white sleeve how well this works with more formal attire. This is truly a polyvalent all-arounder. It's neither a sports watch nor a dress watch, but it functions well as both. Make no mistake, it remains highly anti-magnetic. With a soft iron inner cage to channel magnetic flux lines around the escapement, it also features a niobium zirconium anti-magnetic hairspring, the combination of the two ensuring this watch is undoubtedly more than mil gauss or 1,000 gauss anti-magnetic. 80,000 ampere per meter is the face value, but I don't believe it's the limit. I think that's a minimum for this watch. And 100 meters water resistant, that watch has everything going for it. Omega, Rolex, why don't we talk about Breitling? We should, it doesn't get enough time on the show, but this is still one of the traditional big three of Swiss mainstream luxury horology, and this is probably the best current model. Now, I don't know how this looks on screen. It's looking a little bit bronze on my monitor. Make no mistake, it is a rich metallic British racing green because this is the Premier 01 Chronograph 42 Bentley, and you could see the engine-turned Bentley nameplate on the flank held by bolts referencing the engine-turned dashboards of Bentley Boys era Bentley cars from the late 20s, early 30s when the company and its famous fast trucks, to quote Ettore Bugatti, or to paraphrase, dominated the 24-hour race. So this is the best of Breitling for Bentley because the model is fundamentally the premier Automatic winding, 70 hour power reserve, COSC certified, vertical clutch column wheel, Breitling caliber B01 inside the case, a wearable size, and again 100 meters, so this is an all around sports watch and loomed. You could see the flying B and winged logo on the case back, as well as the frankly quite attractive B01 caliber. We rarely saw it during the Schneider family ownership of the company, but now under Georges Kern we're seeing it on almost every model, and that's a good thing. Technically sophisticated, quite accurate, and today quite tough and reliable as well. This is a movement worthy of the watch, and the watch is handsome. Not excessively sized, it's a full-sized modern men's all-arounder. A complication, yes, but handsomely executed with some vintage tones, such as the rectangular pushers, the simple two-register dial, the five-link bracelet, and I should also say, pardon me, the seven-link bracelet, and I should also say the box section sapphire, that emulates a vintage plexiglass. It's a really good looking watch. Owing nothing to the Bentley lineage or co-branding, I happen to find that the presence of the British racing green dial is the icing on the cake that seals the deal and convinces me that the automotive co-branding was worth it on that watch. Jumping back to the world of Rolex, let's talk about the Cosmograph. One motorsports inspired chronograph with Bentley to another, the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona, the official winner's gift in the 24-hour race each January at Daytona International Speedway. Now, of course, this is a rare model that launched back in 2016. White gold, full bracelet, blue dial, and absolutely stunning. The feature often missed in online photos are the red sub-register chapter rings. On the dial, there's a flash of red to complement the silver and the blue. Colorful, handsome, engaging, and substantial, all in white gold, with solid center links, end links, and a milled out clasp. The nice thing about the Daytona is that it is old school Rolex with lovely tapered lugs and a handsome complex curvature to the case flank. You can see how it's rounded around and down. 12.2 millimeters thick, and it wears true to size 40 millimeters, whereas a modern GMT or sub is gonna wear more like a 42 than the rated 40 millimeters. This does feel like a 40, and again, just over 12 millimeters thick, sitting close to the wrist. Vertical clutch, column wheel, three-day power reserve movement, Rolex caliper 4130, silky smooth winding. It also features 100 meter water resistance, so after the race, you can have fun in the surf at Daytona Beach. This one is good for all occasions, and in white metal, as discreet as any stainless steel. A secret, well-kept, stealth wealth between you and your watch. But if you want the most extravagant and most complicated Rolex of all time, you want the Sky Dweller. Launched, frankly, to widespread shock at Baselworld 2012, this GMT annual calendar 
three-day Powell Reserve chronometer didn't come into its own until 2017 when the model you see here, sometimes described as the Steel Sky Dweller, was launched. Now, it does have some white gold in the Ring Command bezel, but the entire bracelet, the clasp, as well as the 42mm case are stainless steel. The watch has it all. It's 100 meters water resistant and it features a clever mechanism. Now, the crown, when it's out in its first position, it does nothing. I take the bezel and I turn it counterclockwise one click. You could see the date. It is the second. Now I'm going to turn back, by directional note, I'm going to turn back and note how the red square jumps from aperture to aperture, 12 hours, 12 months. So I'm looking right here at December 31st. Now I jump to January 1st. An annual calendar, it need be adjusted only once per year during the jump from February to March. Now I'm going to turn it one more click counterclockwise and note how I can step the local hour hand independently. I can even drive the date with it, but note that the watch is still ticking and I haven't affected the second time zone. Now I move everything in sync. You can see that 24 hour second time zone moving around within the blue sunburst dial. The ring command bezel is used to change the function of the crown. Screw the crown back down. Inside the case, Rolex caliber 9001. Not as big as you'd imagine a 42. I find it wears a little bit like the Milgauss, and you can see that the case profile is rather similar to the Milgauss, the date just and the date date. So while it's a large Rolex watch, it is not a super case profile. Handsome, comfortable, substantial, and yet not so tall that it wouldn't fit underneath a jacket cuff. I like this watch a lot. If you want the most complicated Rolex ever made and possibly the ultimate travel watch, this one right here, I should mention too, with a fully loomed dial, a feature you will not find on every version of the Sky Dweller, this one makes an even better sports watch and travel companion. That said, not all of us have a Sky Dweller budget, and when the time comes to fly high without a high flyer's pocketbook, there is the 2019 Oris Pro Pilot X Caliber 115, a 10-day power reserve, 44.7 millimeters in the Pro Pilot case. It is actually a lot more wearable than you'd imagine, thanks to a slender case profile and titanium construction. An open dial reveals the skeletonized Caliber 115, a manual wind manufacturer movement, 10-day power reserve with a power reserve that travels at variable speed. You can see how the first three days of power reserve cover consistently considerable expanse. As you get closer to exhaustion, the hand travels more quickly to make the rundown more salient. Fully loomed, note the nickel anthracite coating to give the watch a handsome gray metal monotone sheen. Look at the integration of the bracelet. Not just a handsome integration of lug and end link, but also look at the faceting and how the bracelet falls away to its side. The profile of the individual links, not just slash cut in a V form, but actually lower on the flanks than on the center. And Harrison's doing a great job of showing that right there. This this is an intelligently designed integration. Now note the buckle system that Oris uses. Inspired by airline seat belts, you lift to unlock, throw it on the wrist, and though almost 45 millimeters, this one wears a cinch. Nice and low. It's actually thinner at just over 13 millimeters than the Sky Dweller we just saw, and 100 meters water resistant, so even though it's a pilot's watch, it's a very viable all-around sports timepiece. I know you're going to want to see the case back, so I'm going to show you the case back. That's caliber 115. You can see it is handsomely executed, mostly machine executed given the price point but thoughtfully designed and handsomely decorated. This is a manufactured product from Oris proving that when it comes to engineering, the folks at Oris can be among the best in the business. They are doing fun things in Holstein. Now we talked about baller budgets and not everyone's got one. And if maybe even the Oris is a bit too much pilot's watch for your pocketbook, allow me to introduce from Hanhart, the Pioneer Mark I, a mono pusher 40 millimeter chronograph modeled on a 1938 design created for the Luftwaffe. This is a timepiece that is handsomely executed with a combination of silver, black, and red accents. Now it has a lovely knurled bezel, bi-directional, 
with a red index like 1930s pilot watches, and then it has cathedral style hands on its black dial. There's a lovely twin counter array, and as you can see, there is a mono pusher system. It is a La Jupere modified Valju 7753, but it is a manual wind version and 100 meters water resistant. This is a timepiece that wears well on just about any wrist because the size is close to universal and the thickness under 13 millimeters means that this is appropriate as a dress watch should you be so inclined. An unusual watch from an unusual brand that we don't often feature, this is a compelling option in the sub $3,000 full bracelet sports complication category. And again, a little nostalgic nod to the past. I don't think too many folks are going to be nostalgic for the World War II Luftwaffe, but the look of a 1930s pilot's chronograph, absolutely. Okay, we spoke about bowler budgets before. Now let's pretend we have them once more. And the Richard Mille RM5. Launched in 2004, it was the first simple three-hand automatic date watch from Richard Mille. And of course, it has the characteristic Richard Mille tonneau case. Moreover, these early examples were rated as water resistant down to 100 meters. So they're a bit desirable as they were expressly rated to the kind of water resistance that I think most of us see as a sort of go no-go for swimming with our watch. 45 millimeters from lug to lug and less than 12 millimeters thick. The watch is 38 millimeters wide, meaning smaller than the RM10 that succeeded it in every regard. It wears like an absolute cinch. Now the warmth of this rose gold will endear it to those who felt that perhaps the titanium and white metal options were just a little bit too mechanical, a little bit too sterile. This one gives you a little bit of visual heat. You can also see that the curvature of the case, and I'll demonstrate this in profile, the curvature of the case with a camber on the underside means that it conforms nicely to the shape of your wrist and it is incredibly comfortable. You can see from head on how much clearance I've got on both sides of my wrist. So you've got wonderful options with the smaller wrist to wear this watch well. I recommend it for wrists as small as 13 centimeters circumference. The movement is impressive. It's heavily modified from a base Vauche 4000. Uh, Vauche, of course, the movement manufacturer arm of Parmigiani. 55 hour power reserve, twin barrels, a few things to make it more shock resistant. First, you can see there are shock absorbers at all four corners, mounting the movement to the case. There are little toroidal rubber donuts to isolate the movement. The movement is all grade five titanium, so there's very little sprung mass. And then there's a free sprung balance to help further degrade the effect of shock on the timing and precision. You can see there are little variable polar moment wings in white gold on the rotor. So you move these wings in or out to change the winding vigor based on your level of activity. Richard Neal Watchmaker makes those changes. An impressively modified movement from Vauche, one of the great movement manufacturers in the business. And of course, an undeniable and iconic appearance on the wrist or off. If you want an absolutely bonkers watch, but you don't have $76,000, well, this past year, 2019, Zenith launched an update of its 2017 DeFi El Primero 21, the black carbon model, still 44 millimeters and 100 meters water resistant. It takes the caliber 9004 dual movement chronometer El Primero and puts it in a 44 millimeter forged carbon case. Now you can see the carbon is impressive because it has a characteristic unidirectional pattern to it. So the woven fiber is simply compressed, it is forged, it is machined, and then it is cured. And you can see inboard the movement as well as the open dial have been blackened to create a handsome monotone murdered out look. Two escapements, one beaten away at 360,000 vibrations per hour, one 36,000 vibrations per hour, two power reserves and two barrels, a power reserve indicator at 12 o'clock for the 50 minute manual wind chronograph power reserve, and then there is a 50 hour power reserve automatic winding for the El Primero escapement. Now this has a one one hundredth of a second food rail, and I'm gonna hold it up to my mic because it has a wonderfully distinctive sound to it. We're going to throw it on the wrist. This one is feather light, absolutely unobtrusive, a combination of carbon and sapphire. It, it weighs what you would expect a 38 or 37 millimeter steel watch to weigh. So while it is definitely stark, and for some it's not going to be an all the time watch, it's technically impressive, visually imposing, and very comfortable on the wrist. You get a very dark brown alligator leather insert on top of a rubber strap, a little bit of artifice borrowed from Hublot that gives you the luxury of the leather and the durability of 
the rubber. Full deployment clasp in titanium, by the way. Just thought I'd throw in that extra detail. Now, to move away from sports watches for a bit, this model was launched back in 2008, and I've often called it the New York cookie. Black and white, like the fondant cookie sold in New York, it is a Glasuta Original Pano Tourbillon XL. Now, it has a few complications. First, the titular tourbillon. Second, a retrograding date. And finally, there is a power reserve. You could see that for the tourbillon, the capstone is actually a diamond, which is exquisite and exceptional. Now, I'm going to start winding it up here, assuming I'm winding it in the correct direction. You could see the caliber 41 spring to attention. And note, this watch is loomed. Now, the timepiece is handsome to look at, but it's even more pleasurable to wear. Trigger actuated white gold double deployant clasp. This is a 42 millimeter white gold case that's fairly low slung on the wrist at under 13 millimeters thick. So if you want to wear this one with a dress cuff, you can see it's not excessively broad and the lug profile wraps well around the wrist. So ergonomically, this one is a real winner. If you've got that smaller wrist like I do, it doesn't wear anything like a 42. Think of the ergonomics of this one as more like a 40. The case back is impressively executed, as we would expect from the folks in Glasuta. You could see the Glasuta stripes. They are not Cote de Genève because we are not in Switzerland. And note the spiral solar finishing on the wheels of the winding train. Also note the use of jewels set in screw fix chiton, as in the pocket watch era, as well as both black polished and blued screws. Truly impressive stuff and a rare watch, even by the standards of an uncommon brand. That said, here I have what is the epitome of a mainstream brand and a most uncommon model from the CPCP Collection Privé Cartier Paris that ran from 1998 to 2008. This is the Platinum Cartier Tortue Perpetual Calendar, a perpetual calendar driven by a Girard Perigo 3000 series base movement. This is Cartier at its best, combining the finest parts with exquisite unmistakable Cartier style, a rose lathe guilloche dial, a secret signature in the X, the Roman numeral of the 10 o'clock station. Note the cruciform balance of this dial and the exquisite integration of the bezel into the case band. There is no separate bezel on this watch. Note the camber of the sapphire curving handsomely and in a wonderfully beguiling form over the dial. The watch is 34 millimeters wide by only 43 millimeters lug to lug and 11.9 millimeters thick, so it wears well on any wrist. In platinum, though not large, it is exquisitely heavy. It features a real sapphire cabochon on its crown, and you can see the heavily modified finishing for Cartier by Girard Perigo for the movement itself. You want to see real sapphire, not a spindle, right there. Throw it on the wrist, and it has substance to it. With a platinum clasp and a platinum case, this is a bite-sized perpetual calendar with big personality. Any Cartier has gravitas. The way Rolex does, the way Patek Philippe does, it is an old name and a blue blood. And while not every Cartier watch lives up to the myth of Louis Cartier, the bottom line is that this watch does. This is a Cartier that would have been a Cartier in any era, when Cartier was the king of jewelers and the jeweler to king add watchmaker and it would be most apropos this is as grand as Cartier watchmaking gets you don't need any more complexity or size this thing is a king now speaking of watches we love there is none that I consider a better value in complications than the Zenith pilot double matic 45 millimeters in stainless steel, it's not big for what you're getting. You're getting world time. You're getting a double digit grand date with a quick set. You're getting an on off function for an alarm. You're getting an El Primero automatic high beat chronograph. And you're getting a remarkable dynamic power reserve indicator that changes color and size. So let me set this one up to fire. And now take a look at the dial. A color changing, shape shifting alarm power reserve. From green to red. And of course you have that on off function. The blocks of Luminova, and they are solid blocks, comprise the numerals. So the numerals are solid three dimensional hewn blocks 
of Superluminova that have a wonderful loom effect at night. Throw it on the wrist, it's easy to wear. This is a big watch, but not an overpowering one. I can wear it on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist with clearance on both sides. Meaning if your wrist is 15 centimeters, you could still wear this watch well. An absolute pleasure and for a little over $10,000, the best value in compound complications. And probably the only watch on the table that can rival the Sky Dweller for travel watch street cred. Column wheel, lateral clutch, El Primero movement on the case back, and a truly special watch, one of the best of its era, launched back in 2012. I adore that piece. Now, IWC, let's talk Portugueseers. Let's double up. In fact, let's triple up, because we've got an IWC Portuguese F.A. Jones, and we've got a one two-second, split-second, Rattrapont Portuguese. Let's start with F.A. Jones sequentially as he came first. In 1868, Bostonian-American F.A. Jones traveled to Switzerland with patents and schematics to create American-style pocket watches with Swiss talent. The French wanted nothing to do with him. In the Western Watch Valley, the French Swiss simply rejected the idea of adopting American watch manufacturing norms. They didn't want to work in a factory American style. The Germans, however, were open-minded, able, and willing, and thus International Watch Company was founded. Pocket watches, obviously, until the early 20th century. This watch was launched in 2005, 43 millimeters in stainless steel, a limited edition of 3,000 pieces, with a dial and an onion crown paying tribute to the F.A. Jones era pocket watches, and you can see a 12-layer lacquer dial with blue printing on a white gloss base, and you can see some of the glint and the gleam as I move it through the light. I'm trying to avoid the glare here, but it is like an enamel dial of a 19th century IWC pocket watch. You can also see the onion style crown, the trim case band, and on the reverse side, caliber 98290. Manual wind with pocket watch style, the damaskining that you would have seen on a vintage Jones era IWC pocket watch, the 25 millimeter long Jones arrow index micro regulation. You could see the three quarter style bridge in a movement that's 37 millimeters in diameter, a balance enormous, beating away at 18,000 vibrations per hour with a handmade overcoil hairspring and five position adjustment. You could see that the timepiece featuring the world's largest hacking lever you can actually spot it in action just over the balance. And then real quick on the wrist, Harrison, I know I'm gonna get back in order with these, I apologize. You can see it's actually a flat watch. It's broad, but it's not thick, meaning despite its size, it wears well as a dress timepiece. And because of the formality of the pocket watch dial, it wears even a little bit better with upscale attire. I'm gonna do this in order now. The dial first. And you can see this is the 2016 250 piece stainless steel IWC Portugieser Rattrapont Munich edition made for the Munich boutique. The watch is 40.9 millimeters in stainless steel featuring a combination of silver, white, blue, and red accents on the dial. Now it is a split second chronograph and you can see the ability to time two concurrent events such as cars around a racetrack and determine by splitting the seconds whether the gap between them is waxing or waning. It's also quite handy for the kids' track meet. Now, because this is a 40.9 millimeter Portuguese, it wears more easily on smaller wrists. It's still a substantial watch, make no mistake. It's not petite by any means, but nor is it enormous like the 43 millimeter F.A. Jones. You can see it's close coupled, low slung on the wrist. The lug shape really helps to wrap around the wrist here. And the case back of the watch is handsome as it features the seat of the Archdiocese of Munich. And this is the, I believe it is called the Frauenkirche. It is a cathedral work on which started in the year 1240. It's been around for a while. And as you can see, individual numbering out of the 250, individual numbering is rare on IWC limited editions. Now, we've been a little bit far afield. We've seen some independents, some mainstream brands, some unusual watches from mainstream brands, but the next one is truly a watch apart, as this is the Resence Type 1W, silver white dial, 41 millimeter, grade five titanium case, and the most unusual regulator you will ever encounter. And it is a regulator, as hours, minutes, and seconds have been separated. Now, you can see the watch, which features no crown, is set using its case back. 
and I'm going to demonstrate the time right here. If you've never seen one of these before, you are now looking at 2 p.m. How do I know that? Because the minute hand is at 60, the hour hand is at 2, and then I have seven days of the week moving in a clockwise direction. Those two hollow arcs are Saturday and Sunday in sequence. So you can see right here, it is 2 p.m. on Friday. I'm looking at the day of the week that corresponds to the last solid arc, and that is Friday, and it is just past the halfway point, so I know I'm looking at 2 p.m. Turn it all over, you can see the rotor wobbling. It is an automatic winding watch. You can wind it as well as set it with the case back. ETA 2824 base and the Resonance Orbital Convex System, a movement with over 100 parts and 15 joules in its own right placed on top of the base caliber. You can see it wears rather like a wire lug radiomere. Very flat, comfortable, with almost no lugs to speak of. I can recommend it for truly tiny wrists, even as with its character, personality, and wrist presence, it stands out even on tree trunk forearms. And I'll also mention that this timepiece in grade 5 tie is both exceptionally light and exceptionally scratch resistant. Uh, the back and the front composed of sapphire, one of my favorite brands, and by the way, that watch is extravagantly loomed. It is truly a sight after dark. Jeger Le Coult, my original flame. I still love the brand, respecting it immensely for its sheer range of competence and its back catalog of classics, and this is one of them. The first ever round ceramic case made by Jaeger Le Coult. this is the 2008 Amvox 3. 300 pieces in black ceramic as well as rose gold. You can see that all of the metal garnishing on the ceramic 44 millimeter case is rose gold. Now the dial is designed to evoke the speedometer of a vintage Aston Martin as Aston Martin cars from the 1920s through the 1930s employed Jaeger gauges. You could see that the bottom of the dial not calibrated both because that's how it would be done on an automotive gauge but also because that is where the tourbillon regulator is located. Now to avoid blocking the tourbillon with the date and move a little bit closer so Harrison can get this one. We're fighting the glare a little bit. Guys, the studio is a work in progress. We heard your complaints about the sound. Next, we're working on the light and the set. You could see at midnight, on the jump from the 31st to the 1st, the date hand makes a complete jump across the tourbillon to avoid obscuring it at all. You'll also note that there is a little stub hour hand, skeletonized and polished, that corresponds to an AM PM disc at the top of the dial. So it's not just a tourbillon with a date, it is a tourbillon with a date and a GMT. The case back featuring some of the patrimony from the 2007 Extreme Lab 1. You have unidirectional winding with ceramic rotor bearings for efficiency, but they take it to the next level with the Extreme Lab's rotor system. Carbon fiber, hollow spokes, and then a platinum iridium mass to create what might be the most efficient winding automatic movement in history. This is caliber 988. It is a customized and hot-rodded version of the caliber 978 that won the 2009 Laloque Chronometry Championship over August Company, including JLC's own Gyro Tourbillon 2. I know, I know, I know. Out of sequence. I'm sorry, man. 44 millimeters on the wrist. You can see this one wears well. Though the rose gold does add some mass. For the most part, this is sapphire and this is ceramic, so it is a very light watch due to the minimal density of the materials used, and it does feature a full deployant clasp. I regret the fact that many JLC watches today no longer feature full clasps in an attempt to pair retail prices. This one was the most expensive and the most complex of the Amvox series. It was a king, and it remains so. Patek Philippe. It's odd that we don't feature Patek more prominently on the show, but today I have only one watch. Launched in 1992 and made until approximately early 2006, this is the Patek Philippe 5040G. This is the Dash 016 model, approximately 34 millimeters wide by 42.5 millimeters lug to lug. It is very much like the Cartier Tour 2 in size, construction, and shape. As you can see, it features no separate bezel, and the two watches really are almost like brothers from another mother here, with the Patek having a slightly sweeter case in terms of its lines and proportion. Now, the Patek has a black dial, which makes it an immediately desirable combination. A perpetual calendar moon phase, you can see it features applique white gold Arabic numerals on a matte black base. It has that same integrated bezel construction and the lovely cushion case profile. On the reverse side we have, oh, I know, I'm going back to the wrist shot man, sorry about that, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to keep this thing in sequence. I owe this guy a box of gum. You can see on the wrist it's very compact, easy to wear, absolute pleasure. This is a discreet traditional men's dress complication for those who want no bombast, 
no flamboyance, uh, no declaration of anything but taste. This is the ultimate dress watch, and at the same time, because of the black dial and the white metal case, it can be worn casually. Okay, now we'll do that case back. I got one more chance to get this right. You can see micro rotor caliber 240, old school, five position adjustment, Geneva hallmark. The micro rotor's advantage is that it allows you to see the entire case back while still retaining the winding convenience of an automatic. It also makes the watch thin the way a manual wind would be. The 240 made originally in 1977 still in the catalog as Patek's premium automatic movement. And you can see why. Okay, let me see, have I missed anything? Have I forgotten any watches? Because I cannot top this. If I have to backtrack, it's gonna be an anticlimax. This is the Erverk UR105 CT Streamlined. Launched in 2017 for the 20th anniversary of Erverk. This is an extraordinary cabriolet top, Art Deco inspired scrolling hours, wandering hours complication, automatic winding in titanium. The watch is 53 millimeters lug to lug by approximately 39 millimeters across. Now the timepiece, of course, designed by Martin Fry and built under the aegis of watchmaking chief and co-founder with Martin Fry of Erwerk, Felix Baumgartner, who's huge at six foot six. But this watch features the famed wandering hour complication that Erverk, let me pull the crown out first, the wandering hour complication that Erverk made its signature with the very first UR101 back in, pull the crown out again, back in 1997. So this was the 20th anniversary watch. This is easier to do when I turn the watch upside down. Sometimes trying to showboat while show and tell is a little bit different. Now you can see the revolving carousel, and it's very simple. When the preceding hour moves off the scale, the succeeding hour moves onto the scale, you are now looking at 6.30. You are now looking at 7.10. And you are now looking at 8.40. When you open up the cabriolet case, you can see the entire, I'm gonna adjust it from the bottom, you could see the entire cabriolet revealing the mechanism in motion. And you could see how not only are the hours moving into the scroll at the base, but they actually rotate and pirouette while they are underway within their carousel. Now the timepiece, of course, is Art Deco inspired because it recalls the early days of Erwerk when Martin Fry and Felix Baumgartner spent time in New York and they were inspired by the Art Deco towers like the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building. And of course, this watch has elements of both. It also has the traditional Erwerk aesthetic somewhere between a machine, and I don't mean a watch kind of machine, I mean a science fiction device and conventional horology. The watch is automatic winding with an unusual feature. I mentioned the Richard Mille allowed you to customize the winding efficiency. Well, here you can see through the case back the pneumatic winding brakes that are connected to the rotor system that winds the Zenith Elite base. And there is a switch that allows you to control the winding efficiency, maximum winding efficiency, a middle setting, and then locked out. You make the choice. You have the option of all three, and you can set manually using a selection lever. No need to resort to a watchmaker as with Richard Mille. This timepiece on the wrist, and I know, I messed it up. I killed the last one. To the last, I'm out of sequence. But the watch wears like something out of Star Trek. As you can see, it's fairly compact as the pivots are closer together than the actual lug-to-lug -lug dimension of 53 millimeters. So this is an easy watch to wear in titanium with those distinctive lugs. The Erwerk you are 105 CT Streamliner, 100 pieces in titanium. Guys, thank you so much. Again, prices in the description, reference numbers and names in the description. Email tmasso at thewatchbox.com if you see anything here that you love. And of course, well, <laughs> frankly, I'm not going to throw anything else out there because we're almost at 45 minutes. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. Time out, Tim out. Have a great weekend, and thanks for logging on.